the CPRI Knowledge Hub and CPRIHub.org, this is Research Minutes, a deep dive into new and important research in the realm of education. Today, we conclude our three-part series centered on one big question. What have we learned about learning? The reality is that we are immersed in a digital world. It will do us no good to put a thumb in the dike. We have to exert science and yoke it to technology. That question guides the 2018 year-end issue of Kappen Magazine. And today, in partnership with Kappen, we welcome renowned literacy scholar and author Marianne Wolf. Wolf sits down with CPRI director Jonathan Sapovitz to discuss her new Kappen article, her new book, Reader Come Home, and one of the most pressing topics in literacy education. We read 50 to 100,000 words a day, so we have to be able to, to filter and read quickly. Skim. The amount of material that we don't see even, that we don't process, has really multiple implications in terms of cognition. Now that leads us to becoming susceptible to false information. Wolf sheds light on the science of reading, the drawbacks of digital screens, and provides a roadmap for educators and policymakers hoping to adapt to and make the most of reading in the digital age. That's right now on Research Minutes. This is Jonathan Sapovitz, the Director of the Consortium for Policy Research and Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Today, I'm happy to be joined by Marianne Wolf, a renowned literacy scholar and author of the new book, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World. Marianne also serves as the Director of the Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learners, and Social Justice at UCLA's Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. She just published a new article entitled The Science and Poetry in Learning and Teaching to Read in the December-January issue of Kappen Magazine. Marianne, it's such a pleasure to have you today. Uh, for me as well, John. One of the totally amazing parts of your research and the way you introduce the Kappen article is to describe how the brain is not wired for reading in the same way it's wired for speaking. So what is the reading circuit in the brain that you're talking about? Well, John, one of the absolutely amazing things after all the years of studying language in the brain is to recognize that we were never meant to read. There are genes for language, for vision, for cognition, for affective processes, there's not a single gene in the brain that is dedicated to reading. And what reading represents is something new for the species. It's only 6,000 years old. And so what the brain has as its, I think, almost special capacity is the ability to make a new circuit for a new cognitive function. Things like numeracy and literacy have no real genetic aspect in the brain by themselves, but they are using parts that are genetically there, but they're using them in new ways with new arrangements. So if you think of a circuit in the house, you may have a basic circuit and then you need new lighting. You make changes to that circuit. Well, what reading does, it first establishes this very basic circuit connecting vision and language, and then something very special happens. And this is unique to literacy and numeracy in terms of new functions. It gives a scaffolding that can grow over time with the experience of the human being. So that in the beginning, the circuit is pretty primitive, and that's like what a six-year-old has, a very basic decoding. And then over time, that becomes so automatic that the brain allows this basic circuit to get connected to ever more sophisticated processes. What I liken and give the term deep reading is a set of very highly sophisticated cognitive, linguistic, and even affective processes that each require a little time, we're talking milliseconds, but that over the years become these elaborated networks that allows us to take what was a very basic circuit and have something that is capable of connecting to itself everything it knows about the new topic that's being read and then gives us the capacity to make inferences. These deep reading processes begin with decoding, but then the first, as that first reader becomes automatic with that, 
it begins to make analogies. Human beings are analogy makers. So they begin to make analogies between what they know already and what the new material is there. That stuff of analogy then becomes the basis for what I call the scientific method processes in our brain. We learn how to infer from that material. We learn how to deduce, induce, which all serves as a kind of a petri dish of a thought for making a critical analysis of all that information and what we do to it. The affective processes that we possess, our ability to look at this information, and especially in the case of novels or fiction, be able to go outside ourselves to learn the perspective of another person, to feel what it means to be this other. We are engaging our empathy processes and also our theory of another mind. So the deep reading processes allow us to be critically analytic. They allow us to be empathic. And then in what I call the Miss Marple or the Proustian moment, we sometimes are enabled by this beautiful, almost miraculous deep reading set of processes to have an insight of our own. And that's what Proust meant when he said that at the heart of reading, we go beyond the wisdom of the author, and that becomes the beginning of ours. So the reading circuit is that full panoply in the expert reader of the basic circuit that's become elaborated with just an extraordinary range of sophisticated, cognitive, affective, even motoric processes. All of it comes together. You really capture the incredible complexity, but it's also very malleable, as you suggest, and you talk about this concept of neuroplasticity. And so how does that contribute to this? That's such an important point. The fact is, since we don't have genes that are dedicated for reading, we don't have the capacity that we have with something like vision or language, where the genes are just programming and it unfolds. You know, you put that any child in, a, in an environment and that's going to help them learn that language or see anything. Reading doesn't have that. It's plastic. It is made out of a rearrangement of those older parts. But because there's no genes, the Achilles heel and the strength, both, is this neuroplasticity. It will become a full-blown expert circuit for those who are reading over time and developing those neural networks. Or it can remain very primitive very basic, like a first grader. It all depends on the environmental experiences and the ways that how and what we read change the circuit. When I say how and what we read, I'll give you a perfect example. We're mostly reading English. I don't know about you, John, but I have tried to read Korean. <laughs> I've also tried to read a little Chinese. There's a little bit behind me. But the reality is that's a different circuit. You build a circuit that reflects the requirements of the particular language so that with Chinese or the Japanese kanji, you have to remember, uh, even to be a fifth grader, 5,000 characters in Chinese. Well, that requires a lot more visual memory. So the brain circuit of a Chinese reader and a Japanese kanji reader is going to have much more of the right hemisphere visual cortex involved than anything you and I have, unless you do speak Japanese or Chinese. So we really have different circuits based on the fact that it's plastic. Now, there's a lot of similarity in a reading circuit, but there are differences. And now we come to the big change in the 21st century reading brain circuit. Not only does the circuit reflect different writing systems. It reflects the requirements, if you will, the affordances or characteristics of the medium in which it's reading. So there are going to be differences when you read a book or anything that's tactile concrete 
we'll just call that print medium, versus a screen. A screen has particular affordances that are quite happily devoted to uh, our ability to process a great deal of multiple sources of information that's advantaged for that, but disadvantaged for the slower processes that print advantages. So what you're going to see through neuroplasticity is that you can have different circuits for different writing systems, and you can have different circuit emphases if you're reading one medium or another. It's interesting, and I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about what science has shown us about these differences that show differences between print and digital media and what we still don't know. Let's just begin with some of the differences that we know. Print advantages the allocation of time to the deep reading processes. That's a tremendous advantage for it. So that the milliseconds that you require are actually uh, for, to do true critical analysis and to have empathy on all these other processes to bring them to bear, it, that requires extra milliseconds. Now, when we're on a screen, we are able to look at multiple sources of the uh, that are attracting our attention. Uh, we can filter. Um, and in fact, we read 50 to 100,000 words to a day, not long form, but we, we read that much. So we have to be able to, to filter and read quickly, skim. In fact, that's the word of the day. We have become a society for whom skimming is the new normal. When we are skimming, we're by and large using an F or a Z pattern. We're word spotting. We're browsing our way through a page or through a text. The reality is we don't expend the time. It's not that we cannot, it is that we do not. And so when we use this F or Z pattern of, of skimming, the amount of material that we don't see even, that we don't process, has really multiple implications in terms of cognition. We don't have the time to be analytic. Now that leads us to becoming susceptible to false information, to false fears. It allows us to think we're reading it, so it has to be true, without those breaks from the evaluative processes that we use with deep reading. So skimming is both a necessary byproduct of our digital world but it also carries some really important implications for how we read. The screen has both advantages and disadvantages. Now, one of the things that people don't realize is that the dominant mode of reading bleeds over. So if you're on screen, like you and I undoubtedly are, six to 10 hours a day, you assume that when you turn to a different mode of reading, that you'll be able to uh, deploy your deep reading skills, including something that we call the immersion in text, our ability to become transported by it, to, to leave ourselves behind and, and really enter this other world. What is happening in many of us, and I never thought it would happen to me, is that the screen mode bled over into the reading that I was doing not just for pleasure, but for truly in-depth reading. And I thought I would just test myself, assuming that I would be free of the criticism I bring to the rest of the world. And I chose a book that I knew and had loved, Herman Hesse's Glass Speed Game. It was like molasses over my cerebrum. I couldn't move inside the text. I thought it was anything but great literature. Remember, he got a Nobel Prize for literature based in part on this glass bead game. And I couldn't, honestly, John, it was a terrible experience because I realized I had truly changed. I just had to confront the fact I had truly, truly become just like everybody I was worried about. I had to actually, whether one calls it retraining or simply regaining the discipline of deep reading, which had led me years before to love this book. It took about 10 to 14 days, I can't remember, almost two weeks. I read it for 20 minutes only a day. It took about 
two weeks and then then John it was the experience of being my old self and that's partly why the title is come home I felt I had come home to my reading self but I had absolutely left it as thoroughly as anyone else I had become a skim reader who was superimposing upon text which required the apperception of thought and beauty and I wasn't giving it to them I was word spotting and I only when I regained my old reading self and could take up the pace demanded by the text not superimposed by me only then did I feel I could truly read the book again and I started all over and I read it from the from the beginning again and that's when I remembered who I was as a reader it was a wake-up call from myself if it happens to me John it's going to happen to many people is science able to disentangle the digital experience versus the paper experience versus the rapid fire way that digital media tends to bombard us. All these sort of superficial bursts, the Tatico exposure, is it the the form of the medium or the medium itself? It's both. And it's very it's a very interesting area for current research. So you have certain things that I will say a lot more technical things you can read in the book if you wish, but the real important thing is that a text that's in print actually carries with it a, a very almost kinesthetic, concrete weight, if you will, that gives a geometric quality to your reading. And when I say geometric, I do that intentionally. There's a spatial element to reading in print that allows us to add some of our spatial knowledge so if I ask you in a, a given book, where is the passage on Madame O in this wonderful 19th century German book, I will know that it's two thirds the way down, about one fourth the way through the novella. I actually will have some spatial knowledge. That's one piece that we have. But far more importantly, that spatial knowledge is, is enabling us to know, especially in short term memory, where something was that we didn't know that we go back to. That's called recursion. The property of being able to go back to find what we didn't, we weren't sure of, is part of what's called comprehension monitoring. We're, we're checking ourselves. We're evaluating our understanding. A screen has the opposite uh, effect on us. A screen is transient. We have a psychological set to see things as moving ever more quickly and moving transitorily, transiently away, whether it's the screen of a film and images or the screen digitally, it's something that's moving us, hastening us along. Well, that means there, even though one could go back, one doesn't. So recursion is not happening. If we're looking at a screen that is a computer, our attention is being dispersed. We're lacking both the concrete, the kinesthetic, that the spatial that goes with it, that we are now realizing affects how people allocate time to those comprehension processes. Now, deep reading, a lot of people just see it, deep reading as comprehension. I liken it to a, a whole panoply of processes. But at a more general level, we can call it comprehension, understanding. Well, the research done by the eRead Network and by people in Israel right now is absolutely fantastically interesting. Anne Mangan is a researcher at in Norway in Davangen, and there is a group in Spain led by Lalo Samalin, and in Israel by Tommy Katsir. They are looking at what does a child or an adult do when they read the same material in digital format versus print. Now, John, here's the really big question that I'm going to ask you, and it has two parts. They have made a meta-analysis of 171,000 subjects who are young adults, basically. The task, simply enough, was 
to answer questions of comprehension, how they understood the same text, reading it in digital versus print. These studies started in 2000, ended in 2017. What do you think the overall effect was for which was better for comprehension? So I would say no difference. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you the second question. As the studies move from the year 2000 to the 2017, that is our most native, if you will, digital native, yeah. what do you think the effect is then? So I'll revise my first thing. I would say that initially there was a difference and then it was declining. And what's the difference, though, print versus digital? That initially print had higher comprehension and that over time there was less of a difference. John, I had a very similar set of hypotheses and we're both wrong. The reality is that print has a superiority effect over the whole you know, 17 years, but it becomes greater Wow! the more the digital native is. Why? In part because they, and then the Israelis did this beautiful study, um, Raquette Ackerman uh, did this work in which she showed that the digital native, if you will, is perceiving themselves better on digital because they're reading faster. They were allocating less time thinking that this was a good thing, and they were, in fact, doing worse over time on the screen because of this, in, in a way, mistaken assumption that speed is, is, is the way for you to comprehend. It's not only that simple, but it's a really harsh reality from the largest meta-analysis that the world has ever made in the world of science. And then you pair that study with the other very recent study by Jean Twenge and her group that shows us that our children have changed the, they use the word, the economy of attention, whereas years ago, 60% of our youth would pick up something like a book or a paper or an article, and now it's 16%. Wow. So that we have declined immensely, whereas in social media, 82% of all these youth are on social media. So again, this economy of attention is that it's so weighted towards the screen. And from my standpoint, more from the cognitive neuroscience standpoint, the quality of attention is such that it's so dispersed it's so, if you will, uh, transitory, their attention. They are not giving attention, allocating it sufficiently so they are remembering the material that they should be consolidating, and they aren't holding it in place long enough to exert and deploy the deep reading analytical processes. So we've got a formula that's pretty, pretty tricky going on here. You kind of warn, I guess, implicitly that print is, is an endangered species, uh, yet you also have conservation strategy called the biliterate brain. Can you talk a little bit about building a little bit of more resilience in our brains? The reality is that we are immersed in a digital world, and it will do us no good to put a thumb in the dike. In the, rather, we have to exert science and yoke it to technology and yoke that marriage to what is going on in the formation of our next readers and the re-education of ourselves. So what I'm suggesting is that we have a new approach to educating the new reader and a new approach to re-educating the older reader. The newer one is easier for me. That's my, if you will, my bailiwick are, are the children. They're the ones that led me to, to my biggest worries. Um, and I feel that the best possible way that we can go forward is to take what we know in science this moment and try to fashion the formation of our readers beginning with print. So that, that even though that I'm not ever outlawing a screen, I want less and less 
reliance on a screen in those early years for anything to do with reading. I'm not outlawing it because I think that does more harm than good. But I want the world of print to be part of the sensory motor apparatus of a child anyway. They eat books. You need to be able to eat a book. <laughs> and you want the caretakers, the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters, the grandparents reading books on laps to children. So those first five years is an immersion in print. The next five years, I want them to learn to read on print and learn deep reading skills. I, 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 I can't say enough that we need an emphasis on some of these aspects of empathy and critical thinking in our young. And after they have begun, they have been seeded, then I want our teachers to have professional development that allows them to teach deep reading skills, then transferring them across to the next medium. And you and I know there's not going to be just two mediums. Their future will have multi-medium. We know that. But we need to have our foci on the deep reading processes so that they learn them well on print, they transfer them explicitly so that you're learning how to read on the screen, not in a willy-nilly fashion the way you and I did, but that with conscious understanding that different purposes exist for our reading and that for some purposes, they're going to be better served, not all individuals, there are differences in our individuals, mind you, but by and large, those purposes that are best served by print, print it out or read a book. But those that are best served by, uh, by, by reading more quickly, learn how to do that well. Learn how to exert deep reading skills. Now, the third, if you will, plank of this concept or proposal, and it's only a proposal, is to have a simultaneous trajectory happening on the screen with programming and coding so that our kids are learning uh, Scratch and Scratch Junior and all these wonderful things that make them part of the 21st century. So it's got two different forms of growth that just like Vygotsky made thought and language come together, that's how I want deep reading skills to come together so that that's what we are training our kids and our young adults and our future citizens not to neglect critical analysis or neglect how they read because there's so many important implications as you and I said earlier for democracy. It's all about the best of thought, preserving the best processes as we expand and learn new processes that will even go beyond the ones that we know. But let us preserve as we expand. These messages are so important for today's teachers and for those who are shaping the teaching profession. So, you know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your contribution to Kappen Magazine and for sharing some time with us to help to communicate the importance of deep reading to educators and policymakers alike um, to foster the, you know, the, the continuation of, of what's so important and what we all hold so dear. Marianne, thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you, John. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for listening to Research Minutes presented by the CPRE Knowledge Hub. To learn more about today's topic, pick up the 2018 year-end issue of Cap'n Magazine titled What We've Learned About Learning, now available in print and online at cap'nonline.org. For more episodes of this podcast or to subscribe to this series, visit us at cprehub.org. That's cprehub.org. To share your thoughts on today's episode or suggest future topics, follow us on Twitter at cprehub. We look forward to you joining the conversation.